How you doing? Welcome. Um, we're going to, uh, I'm, I'm uh, coming to you again, uh, live from, from Montana. I did this the last time I taught from here. So I want to show you the view again that I'm, I'm using to, <laughs> to, to meditate and work on these days. So life is good. Uh, this is, this is like the last week that I can get away with working from anywhere in the world. So that's what I'm doing. Um, okay. Here's what we, what I want to do with you this week. We, uh, I want to take a look at the Haftarah. The Haftarah. Um, that's the word for the prophetic reading, not the, the meaning the reading from the books of the prophets. Um, the Hebrew Bible is divided up into the Torah and then the books of the prophets and then the later writings. And on Shabbat, um, going back to the days of Ezra, presumably there is a custom to read from the Torah and then to read a little extra from some selection from the from the books of the prophets. I say I, Ezra started the public Torah reading, um, but we don't exactly know, we don't have a, an official source for um, when the, the Haftarah started, um, but it's a familiar institution, I think, to many of us. It's like uh, the, the, the bat mitzvah girl has to learn the Haftarah along with the Torah reading, right? A little extra. Um, I always thought it was the half Torah, like it's it's the Torah and then the half Torah, but it's not. It comes from the word to fulfill your obligation. So when you when you do the the haftarah, you're you're completing the obligation, and that's why the person who reads the haftarah often reads the also gets the last aliyah, and the, that person is referred to as the maftir. They are the person who's going to complete that obligation for us. So that's like the haftarah. The haftarah, though. Um, it's interesting, these selections, and always interesting, worth taking a look. Um, but it's also, the Haftarah is also, in some ways, our most important or um, most ancient commentator. Um, because the way that the Haftarot have been picked is clearly um, with intention um, for this prophetic reading to connect to something we've just read in the Torah reading and to amplify it. So there's always some connection between the, the Haftarah and the, and, the, and, the, and the Torah reading itself. And, and so we're going to look at the Haftarah today um, in itself, but also um, as a way of kind of getting used to seeing the Haftarah as, as a, a, a offering an interpretation of the Torah reading and, and trying to figure out, okay, what is, what is the, not the prophet, himself, but what is the person who selected that prophetic reading trying to get us to think about or meditate on or see in the Torah reading? Okay, so we're going to do some of that work. Today, we're going to look at um, uh, a, a, a particular, uh, particularly classic selection, um, uh, the reading for the first reading from, um, from Numbers, from the Book of Numbers, beginning the Book of Numbers this week, um, the reading uh, Bamidbar, in the, in the desert or in the wilderness is, is the name of, of the book of the Torah. And the first Haftarah is from the book of Hosea or Hosea. And um, it's, a, it's a classic uh, because it offers us a particular metaphor. And, um, and it's a, I, I, I hesitated. I wanted to teach this. And I also, the, as I prepared it, I started to feel nervous about teaching it because it's a dangerous metaphor. It's um it's a violent, there's something, there, there are overtones of violence to this metaphor. And it's also theologically dangerous. There's something, something doesn't feel like it 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 works in in our conception uh, uh, of God. And and the metaphor um, that we're going to be working with today is um, that of a husband accusing his wife of infidelity. In fact, a lot of infidelity. And um, so we're going to head right into uh, very stark and, um, and tense gender dynamics. And, um, and I want to just say from the outset, uh, first of all, just that this may be upsetting material to some of you, but also um, I hope you know that in this um, in this learning space, all critiques and pushback um, are welcome. That's part of the process. 
So if you're reading this and you're saying, like, I'm, I'm alarmed, I'm disturbed, that's also, I, I also want to hear those um, those reactions. So that's everything is 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 welcome here, um, and you don't have to like this material. But we're reading it in part because it is it is classic material. This this thing that Hosea does, this central metaphor that that he uses to describe the relationship between God and the people of Israel. Um, it's it's worth considering um, because it's a classic, because that metaphor has captured the imagination of. Uh, of our tradition, but also because it brings us to, um, I think, actually a very central Jewish concept, which is is difficult and and disturbing, which is that we have a jealous God, a jealous God. That that in itself is a kind of a metaphor. What does it mean to say that God feels jealous? Like there's something we, there's something unsettling about that. But anyway, I, I'm I'm. Uh, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's um, let's get ready to learn um, by saying uh, a little blessing um, over our Torah study today. Um, and uh, for those doing counting, we counted the 46th night of the Omer last night. And uh, that means we're pretty close to Shavuot. And we have a couple of great Shavuot programs at Ikar, one online and one in person. So check those out um, on our website uh, to learn more. Um, okay. Let's uh, let's say a blessing and, and get into it. Baruch Ata Adonai Elohim Melech Haolam Asher Kitshanu BeMitzvotav VeTzivanu LaAsok BeDivrei Torah. Okay, so here here it is. Here's Hosea. Now Hosea is um, a, a, pro, a one of the what we call the minor prophets. If you were in my my biblical poetry class. We took a look at the th at, at selections from the three major prophets, and those are Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel. Major because they're just big books, it seems. Although they also the fact that their whole huge book was included um, gives lends them a, a sort of a certain stature in in Jewish tradition. So you think Isaiah? Wow, that's. Um, then there are these minor prophets that are important enough to have been included in the in the Tanakh, but. Sometimes we don't like who is Habakkuk and who who was Amos and who was but Hosea is one of the of those twelve minor prophets one of the most important and in fact in at one point the Talmud calls Hosea the greatest prophet of his generation though that in some ways can't have been true because Hosea prophesied at the uh, at the same time as Isaiah surely was the greatest prophet of his generation. But anyway, that's that's Hosea, 18th, 8th century prophet, and one of the major, most major of them, of them, of the minor prophets. Okay, and we're going to go straight into the Haftarah is taken from chapter two, and chapter two is really where Hosea lays out this this metaphor um, that I want us to really um, uh, uh, to use the the word that we sometimes use. We really wrestle with today. Okay, so here's the, um, here's a source sheet for you, and we'll head right in. And as we head in, let's play the game. Let's play the Haftarah game, which I always play um, in shul, which is try, let's try to figure out what's the connection. Because as you read through the Haftarah, like part of the, there's some, there, there's some reason that it's been selected. And if you, sometimes it's just a word. Um, but for example, in the Haftarah, the Haftarah for the at the for the song the the Song of the Sea reading is anyone know? Shirat Devora, the the song that Deborah sings. So a song here, a song there. That's the connection. So there's always some kind of connection. So let's play the game. Can we spot the connection? What is it about this Haftarah? I'm not even going to tell you what the Book of Numbers is 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 all about or what the book of now let's just see if we can spot it and i'm gonna let's make it like a game so unmute yourself if you if you can catch as i begin to read this haftarah what connections uh and we're gonna see a few of them but right from the start we'll get connections to the torah reading okay so let's let's see if we can we can play that game okay so here's hosea chapter two and he begins the number of the people of Israel shall be like that of the sands of the sea, Numbering which cannot be measured. Oh, is someone? Did someone unmute? Yeah, I did. Numbering the okay. people. Okay, what, what do you got for us, Stephen? Numbering the people, which is what. There you go. Now I must admit, Stephen. I'm I'm, I'm particularly delighted to have Stephen here because Stephen and I were corresponding 
at, at one point and and we were talking about um the 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 teaching that i did on the prophets um in my biblical poetry class and he said oh i love that stuff but i really what the, my favorite prophet is hosea i really wish you had taught hosea so in some way this class is for Stephen. like i saw hosea was the reading here i thought oh we gotta we've got it we gotta get that done we gotta teach hosea and indeed some of this is going to be um poetry and we can bring our poetic um eyes to the to the reading as well but back to our back to our question Stephen's exactly right the link here the first obvious link is that there's the number of people of israel and that's a link because Stephen, you want to say what why a link you want to unmute and tell us uh, well, I'm not sure uh, what you're getting at. The, uh, the the Torah portion begins with the numbering of the people of Israel. Um, numbers, the the uh, although it's called the Midbar in Hebrew and in, uh, in English, uh, the translation is numbers because we're numbering the people to a census. And so here, yeah, exactly right. About, yeah, exactly right. That's the word. The word I was waiting for is the census. This is the beginning of. And Stephen said said everything we we needed to know. That's right. The English the uh, the Latin English name is is numbers. Um, Picudim, because the book begins on the first day of the second month in the second year following the exodus from the land of Egypt, the Eternal spoke to Moses in the wilderness of Sinai and that in the tent of meeting saying, take a census of the whole Israelite community by the clans of its ancestral houses, listing the names, every male head by head. And uh, so it's males, and it's not just every males, it's fighting males. You and Aaron shall record them by their groups from the age of 20 years up, all those in Israel who are able to bear arms. So it's a particular kind of census, a military census. But Stephen is exactly right. That, as, the, as, you're, as you're opening your haftarah um, in shul, and you're looking, trying to find the connection, that's the obvious first connection. The number of the people of Israel shall be like of the sands of the sea, which cannot be measured and counted. Now. I don't want to spend too much time on this connection because we have a lot, uh, a lot more to do. But as an example of how we use this haftarah as a kind of commentary on the Torah reading, just think about how that message, the number of the people of Israel are like the sands of the sea, they cannot be counted. How is that a commentary on take a census of all the people of Israel? Right? I'm not even going to, I mean, you could answer that question, but it's, it's almost rhetorical. You can see there's, there's a way in which Hosh, placing Hosea's there is like saying, yeah, 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 there's a census, but truly we cannot be counted. We cannot be reduced to numbers, okay? So that's, that's an example of how the Haftarah provides commentary, okay? But we're going to move a little further, okay? We're going to move, let's get into the, cent the central image that we're going to be dealing with today. And um, we're going to keep playing our game. That is, we're going to keep playing our, our, our connection spotting game because the counting is one connection, but this is a, uh, you know, those who selected these, um, these readings, they meant all for the reading to be exactly right, exactly the right reading. And so often there are a number of connections that we can draw between the two, um, the two readings, the Torah and the Haftarah. So let's take a look here. Let's move a little further. All right. So here we are. The number of the people of Israel shall be like the sands of the sea, which cannot be measured or counted. And instead of being told, you are not my people, they shall be called children of the living God. All those hyphens, I'll explain them later, but the, these phrases are important to Hosea. You are not, instead of being told, you're not my people, they shall be called children of the living God. The people of Judah and the people of Israel shall assemble together and appoint, appoint one head over them, and they shall rise from the ground. For marvelous shall be the day of Jizreel, which is like the city that was the stronghold of the kingdom in the time of, of Hosea, the, north, a north, the northern valley in Israel. Oh, call your brothers my people and your sisters lovingly accepted. All oh, that's a little strange, but as I said, we'll get to it eventually. Here's where I want us to really start doing some analytical work. And here's where things get really difficult. Um, this is what I, I mean by a dangerous metaphor. This is, this is where things get harsh and, and, um, and unsettling. Okay, what do we do with this image here? Rebuke your mother, rebuke her, for she is not my woman and I am not her man. 
and let her put her harlotry, harlotry from her face, sorry, and let her put away her harlotry from her face and her adultery from between her breasts. Rivu v'imchem rivu, ki hi lo ishti v'anochi lo isha, v'taser znuneha mipaneha v'naafu feha mibain shadeha. Else I will strip her naked and leave her as on the day she was born, and I will make her like a wilderness, wilderness. render her like a desert land, and let her die of thirst. Pen afshitena aruma v'hitzagtiha k'yom hivalda v'samtiha kamibar v'shatiha k'eretzia v'hamitiha batsama. Okay, so things are already getting dangerous. Things are already getting um, uh, aggressive. Um, but here, here's the, let's, let's just start with verse four. Rebuke your mother. So it is a father speaking to his children. And the father, she's, she's not my woman. Now the translation in Safaria was, she's not my wife and I'm not her husband. And this is going, I, I, I rendered it woman and man because it's ishti and isha. And th they could be husband and wife, but as you'll see later on, we're going to play around with those terms. So I think for now, we're going to keep it as she is not my woman and I am not her man. Okay, so a father speaking to his children saying, your mother has committed adultery and more than adultery, harlotry is a very... Uh, um, polite word, but it's znuneha, and znut, or zona, or like th that root, we often translate as not harlotry, but prostitution, whoring, um, it's a sex, sex worker, we might say today, but in the biblical, they weren't, they were, the language, they weren't, it means to be disparaging, right? So, okay, <laughs> let's, let's pause here. Now, who is, let's just figure this metaphor out before we move any further. Who's, the, somebody just speak out for me. Who's the father? Who's the mother? Who's the children? Let's start there. Who is this father, mother, and children? I see a couple of hands up. Either of you want to address this? Noah, you want to do that for us? Uh, sure. Uh, though I drew a, num a number of different connections, but for the father, for lack of a better term, I'll just say the father, we'll call that father, uh, God, the divine, the, the wife could be, it could be Israel, it could be Judah, it could be uh, the nation we're talking about, or the kingdom Hoshea is in, in the north, and the children, we'll just call them B'nai Israel, or the children of Israel as the easiest connection, though in some senses that's just could just be a cop-out, but it's an easy connection to draw because Moses is counting the children of Israel. Yeah. Uh, now you have you have some connections. So I'm going to come right back to you, Noah. But I, but I, but you, I think you you said that right. Let's just say it clearly, so so that we're all on the same page. I think Noah's right, though we can Noah offers a little bit of of uncertainty, so we can continue to play with this. Um, but yeah, God is the husband here. God, I don't I right? You'd hey Bob, hey, that's the husband. The wife presumably is us, and this is classic imagery, right? God. Um, in the Song of Songs, like God, the male figure in a relationship, we, the people of Israel, the female figure in a relationship, that's classic. Here, then, that makes us the harlot, the adulteress. But, and, and, and I, I like, it's just, it's disturbing to even think about this. The father's talking to his children and saying, your mother is a whore. And we're also the children right, in this metaphor. We're the children of Israel. Like Israel is our mother, but Israel is also just us. So already we're in kind of very strange place. God is, as uh, God our father is talking to us, telling us that our mother it, it has, is un, has been unfaithful and she's a disgrace, she's a harlot, but we're also the person being accused of that harlotry. And, you know, when I, when I say the metaphor is, is difficult, I mean, 
in content, but also it's a little difficult to place ourselves in it. Like, what are we, who are we supposed to identify with here? Are we supposed to feel sympathetic towards God? Or are we supposed to have disdain for our mother? We're we supposed to be our mother. And so we, if we're being accused. Like, it's a little, like, I, I, I feel already a, 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 a little vexed on how, how, to, how to parse this all out. But first, Noah, uh, you were going to draw some connections for us before we moved forward, some things you saw there. Yeah, the first connection I was seeing was that he's saying, call out your mother she, uh, from the husband's point of view for, for her harlotry. Then I drew the connection of Judah and Tamar. And then from there, I was thinking, isn't this how the book of Echa is getting started that that where that the city of Jerusalem is all destroyed and the, the people are being absconded from their land that's where my mind went okay all right all right so um so just, uh, just that's 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 helpful just a little sort of like Back backdrop here that, that Noah offers us. I'm hearing some you know, backdrop. I'm hearing a lot of noise. Who's who's not muted? Uh, Leia Sofair, could you mute yours? I'm going to mute you, but I I hear you. Um, okay. Uh, e okay. First of all, we have a story in the Book of Genesis where one of our heroes, patriarchs Judah, um, attempts to 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 visit a, a a prostitute, and it turns out to be Tamar, but that's interesting already, because like, so in our liturgy, we have this idea that there are, um, there are prostitutes, and it's not necessarily clear that there's anything wrong with that, right? The, but the, 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 the problem is that is, is embedded in that story, and, the, and a prostitute can be a place where one is unfaithful or one leaves one's relationship, but the actual institution, I don't know, it's there. It's there in the backdrop of you know, of all, all of human history, but, but, but of our tradition as well. And then, yes, as Noah says, again and again, this language of you have betrayed me, you have, you have been a prostitute, you have, you have, you have cheated, you have been, um, and I, I, and I guess I, already I'm feeling like my translations are not good. Prostitute is not a great translation because the word can be used for someone who is selling sexual intimacy, but also just for someone, male or female, who is acting in a sexually um, deviant or lewd, or not even deviant, but just ex desirous, lewd, and stepping outside of manner. One's. Yeah, promiscuous, thank you. Okay, all right, so that's backdrop. Um, I've had a couple of hands up here now for, for a bit, so let me turn to Florine and Matt. I look at it from the context of uh, Hosea being a prophet. If you look at it in that context, Noah is absolutely right. That God is angry at the Israeli pe the people of Israel because they are whoring in the sense that they are selling out, they are committing inequities. And the children are those who are there and still available to learn the right path. Uh -huh. Okay, that's a good separation you're making. So, Florine is right. There, uh, there, there is a sense that, like we that we we could when we're talking about connections between the text of the Torah and the and the and the prophetic reading here, we can just actually point to areas in the Torah and not just in the Torah, but in the Book of Numbers itself, where the people seem to be um, betraying, being unfaithful to God, right? And that language of being unfaithful to God, I mean, that's uh, Noah mentions uh, the the Book of Lamentations, but in some ways, like the most the most obvious connection we could draw is to the Second Commandment, right? The Second Commandment, which just, just says that you shall have no other. It's not just you know don't commit idolatry. Here, let's go down to it. Mm. You shall have no other gods besides me. You should not make for yourself a sculptured image or any likeness of what is the heavens above or on the earth below or in the waters down under the earth. You should not bow down to them or serve them for I, the eternal, your God, am a jealous God. Right? We know that phrase. And part of what we're going to have to try and wrestle with today is well, what did that even mean? 
I'm sure you've read this before and thought, oh my God, that doesn't sound like what I think a God is. God's jealous. Ooh, don't, don't worship other gods. That makes me feel jealous. I want you to be faithful to me. That whole thing is bizarre. Okay. Um, and just to give us one more kind of image to, to work with here, um, Florine says, yeah, and we see that language being played out in the, in the Torah. And here's a selection from the book of Numbers. When Israel was staying at Shittim, the people profaned themselves by whoring with the Moabite women who invited the people to, to the sacrifices for their God, the people partook of them and worshiped that God. So there's that language in order, like by, uh, by, and, and there's a conflation in that scene. There's like, they're with the women and they're with the gods. And right, so the Torah itself is constantly making these comparisons between idolatry and unfaithfulness, right? But unfaithfulness of a particular kind that is a kind of, you know, promiscuous, uh, you know, uh, unbridled uh, mess, I guess. All right, um, Matt Silberstein. I, I, oh, I'm sorry, wait, one more thing. Sorry, I just got so confused in bringing all these sources, I forgot to, to, to highlight one other important thing that, that, um, that Florine said, which is that if the father is speaking to the children, and we are the mother, but we are also the children, then Florian says there's some, there's some in the metaphor that we could be better. But the, the, the point is like we could be not like our mother slash ancestors slash the Israel that we see in the Torah. Okay, so there things are very complicated. They're, we have a father talking to us, telling us that our mother is a whore and we could be better than her. I just want to say like if I'm the child, and I'm hearing that message, my response is not gonna be, oh, I will be better then, thank you very much, dad, right? It's a, this is a very, like, a very painful, ugly family dynamic we're being presented here right up front. Okay, let's hear from Matt and then, and then Pine. Yeah, actually, I wanted to step out of content because content for a minute, do we feel that sometimes the prophets are saying, I'm going to comment about this section, that is to say, is Hosea or somebody else actually saying, I just read Numbers 3, blah, 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 and I'm going to comment about these, that chapter, or are they talking about the same kinds of stuff and later people are connecting them? You know, the, the rationalist answer, the rationalist in me would say, no, of course, the prophets didn't intend to this connection. But there is a tradition, a kind of like spiritualist tradition that suggests, oh, yes, all of these selections, like they were picked through Ruach HaKodesh. They were picked because, yes, the pro it was on that, not only about that, that in the Torah, it was on that very week. The, the prophet that we, they were reading that Torah selection, the prophet said, oh, I have to tell you, this is my commentary on this. So there is, there is a tradition to, to, to read it that way. And I will say this, in, we're going to see, not quite yet, but a little later on, we're going to see an image in this reading that really almost does feel like maybe not a commentary on, on, the, on the Parsha Bamidbar, but certainly a commentary on the a book of Numbers as a as a book of desert journeying. Because remember, what is the book of Numbers? I haven't really said much about it, but it's like there's an exodus and then they're heading towards Israel. And the book of Numbers is in Hebrew, Bimidbar, in the wilderness, it's about that journey. It's about the difficult 40 year journey from Egypt to the promised land. So this it begins that journey and I think Hosea will be speaking to the meaning of that journey as we move forward. Okay, Payam? Correct me if I'm wrong. Aren't most of these prophets a diatribe against the priestly class? So in this sense, the mother would be the priests. And the, I mean, if you look at like Haftorah, the reason the rabbis, the rabbis use the Haftorah as a way to supersede the priestly class. And the, the connection usually between is to use the Torah as the model of 
what it should be versus what it became. Yeah, that I think is fair. Uh, the pre the the prophets do have this very. Uh, you can't you can't all you can't always tell which of the prophets is particularly ardent in the, in making this case, but they do. There is a streak in the prophets of criticizing the priesthood, and it is interesting to think about whether you know Florine split the 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 mother and the children as into generations. And another way of splitting them is one kind of Jewishness or Israeliteness that is being rejected as, you know, unreliable, unfaithful, idolatrous. And you can you can become something else. You can be so the way you're suggesting it that there's like a new kind of Judaism that's much more about ethics and fidelity to God than the rites and rituals of the temple. Possibly, possibly, possibly. Um, all right, let's take one more comment, and then we're going to move forward. Yonatan, Yonatan and Hannah. Yeah, I think one really important way to always read a prophet's criticism is to ask yourself, who can the prophet not criticize directly? Um, and I, I do think that's what's going on here is, you know, that Hosea can't come out and say, our decision makers are crap, right? And like, this country is being run by jokers. Um, but but I think there is kind of the, the, the mother is the collective, right? The Knesset Israel, the... the, the the nation, the decision making that's done at the national level, and the children are us individually. And he's he's calling on us to take responsibility for the way that decisions are being made in the collective sphere. Oh no, I think Rabbi Kasher is stuck. So I'll show you Hannah until he comes back. Yeah. Hey, <laughs> Hi. Quick, now we get to talk. Yeah, Matt, you were passed over anyway. What do you want to say? No, I got back. I asked my question. He doesn't like my rationalist. Oh, it's not true. I lied. I'm back. I'm back. What <laughs> happened? What happened? My internet, I guess, is not as solid. As no, it is too now. late. Too late. We're in charge late. now. Too late. Sorry. Where are we now? I hope. I hope when I leave, you just continue learning without me. Yeah. Where are we now? Who's Who's up? I hope Yonatan's point was brilliant, as it as it always is. But I guess I'll I'll leave I'll leave you to appreciate it. I'm um, sorry about that. Uh, okay. Um, let's move forward now and begin to um, explore kind of where this goes, because uh, it does go certain places. Like we're, we're presented with this very um, harsh and difficult metaphor, and it gets played out for a while, and then suddenly there's a turn. So let's let's first see it play out. But before we do, I want to just point out, if, if no one has in, yet in my absence, that there is another connection here. Right? We looked at the connection between the counting of the census and the number of the people of Israel, but maybe some of you noticed that already we're also using the language of the desert. I will strip her naked and leave her as the, on the day she was born, and I will make her like a wilderness, render her like a desert land, and let her die of thirst. Now, that word, a wilderness, kamibar, that's the same word that begins and, 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 and forms the name of our whole book of the Torah. Bemidbar, where is it? Bemidbar, here. So the wilderness of Sinai. So now the wilderness of Sinai, and this is the kind of work we need to do when we find these connections. The wilderness of Sinai is the state that you will be put in as a kind of revenge for your unfaithfulness to God, okay? The desert is like, is what, what you become, all stripped down like a desert, all lifeless like a desert, naked like a desert, okay? So that's, that's the first pass at what, what is, what is it, what is Hosea saying about the desert, the wilderness, the journey? Okay, but let's move, uh, uh, I, I, see, I see hands here and I don't know what, I'm coming back in confused, so. Uh, David Kurtz, you had your hand up from before. I'm curious what you're thinking. Well, um, the, the desert is what you're leaving. You're going to the promised land. 
Um, we've had Genesis, we've had Exodus, where you leave, and then we had uh, uh, Leviticus, where you learn how to be holy, and it's just it's just the Israelites and God, and now you're going to go among the people. Now you're going back into society. So um, the wilderness is like you don't want to stay here. You don't you want to you want to get to that promised land, and also. Um, uh, what was my other point? Um, just that, I mean, this echoes language that's much harsher later on. You know, God says this, I'm going to do this to you, I'm going to do this to you, you're all, if you're not faithful. So there's a whole, you know, thing going on here, which is now, now it's how do you remain holy going back into the world and on your journey, interacting with the other nations of the world? Yeah, okay, great. So, so in this, in this reading, then the desert becomes, there's something, the desert is a little bit like a punishment. It's a, there's a kind of, the desert is not a place you want to be. It's not a place you want to stay. So why are we there? Why are, why do we have to stay in the desert for 40 years? And though this isn't like, it isn't obvious, uh, the, 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 the interpretation that Hosea, that Hosea seems to be presenting us is um, that there's something wrong with us that needs to be cleansed in the desert or purged in the desert we have to we have to be in this difficult state as a way of pushing us out so that we're ready to be in a better place right the desert is the is the place of transition but a difficult transition okay um one more comment then we'll move forward from wendy i think this the notion of wilderness is extremely important in torah we see that Abraham had to go out into wilderness, into the unknown. Moshe went out into the wilderness, and that's where he encountered God. Uh, um, Joseph went out into the wilderness. Jacob, Jacob really went out into the wilderness, and in the wilderness was where he received um, the angels. The, and our people, to spend 40 years in the wilderness... It's from that experience of being in the nothingness, of the not knowing, of the wilderness. And from there, can we learn and, and create who we are? And I think that's the overall, I, I, my sense from this is that's the overall teaching. And Hosea is trying to, when you talk about your mother, this, these are really deep things. This, how do you... How do you really communicate to somebody the importance of something? You talk about your mother. Mm. And so, okay. this is, so there's, there, this is like, um, and, and we're at this point, we're in the second year from coming from slavery. We have no clue, no clue about who we are, what we are. And so it's, um, anyway, I, I just think that, no, I, I think it's right. a place so, to, we need to go I, back to often. I think to, part of what you're saying is that, look, the, the desert landscape, I mean, it's in some ways, it's like it, you're, you're, you're just underscoring David's question. The desert landscape is a harsh one. And yet it, 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 is, the, the, it is the setting basically for the Torah, for, for, the, for, for, for much of the Torah's journey. And so there is some overarching question, like, what do we learn there? Why do we go there? What revelation takes place there? What, what do we have to, right? It's the, it's, the, it's the place where we get the Torah. But it's also the place where we worship the golden calf, right? Right, and you so can make the wrong decision. Wendy says, Hosea's, as Wendy says, Hosea's reading of what we learn there is, yeah, it's a place that we have to, we have to figure out how to connect to God. Because we, as we've already seen, even when we try, like we're in that desert revelation, we quickly turn to something else. We can't quite handle it. We don't, right? So may, maybe Hosea is saying we need to learn how to, it's going to take some time to learn how to be in relationship with God and to stay in relationship with God and not, not, to, not to deviate from that. Okay, let, let's, on that point, let's, let's give this metaphor more language, harsh language. And then take just another few minutes to process what, if anything, uh, is meaningful about this before we see Hosea himself turn a little bit away, away from it. So let's let's just read a little bit more from from the from the from the Haftarah reading. 
So I will, he continues, um, remember, um, your mother is going to be left out in the desert to die of thirst. Right? Not something you want to hear your father saying. But um, lest you thought you were safe, safe, I will also disown her children. For they are now a harlot's brood. For their mother has played the harlot that she conceived them has acted, she that conceived them has acted shamelessly because she thought I will go after my lovers who supply my bread and my water, my wool and my linen, my oil and my drink. And so I will hedge up her roads with thorns and raise walls against her and she shall not find her paths. Pursue her lovers as she will, she shall not reach them and seek them as she may, she shall never find them. Then she will say, I will go and return to my first husband, for then I fared better than now. And she did not consider this. It was I who bestowed on her the new grain and wine and oil. I who lavished silver on her and gold, which they used for Baal. Now that, that seems like all of a sudden the, the narrative just interrupts and like turn, like the, the, the metaphor is, is suddenly like, punctured by the reality, which they use for Baal. Baal is one of the names of the ancient gods of the, the, of the gods of the, of the ancient Near East. So it's the husband and the wife, it's God and us, but then all of a sudden, it's like, it's not just the metaphor, it's actually being applied, okay? So just, let's just read a couple more lines and I wanna see what you think is happening here. Therefore, I will take back my new grain in its time and my new wine in its season, and I will snatch my wool and my linen that serve to cover her nakedness. Now I will uncover her shame in the very sight of her lovers. And this is very harsh language. I mean, it's not what you want God or a husband or anyone saying. And none shall save her from me. So what do we do with that? Like, what is that? She wants to find all of these, like, I do get all the her wool and her linen and her oil and her bread. She thinks these other lovers will, will provide for, for her, but they're not going to because I'm the one that does that, but I'm not going to do it because I'm angry at her. And what is going on here? Like what, remember, we, we have a pretty obvious kind of metaphor one-to-one. -one. It's idolatry, unfaithfulness. But now it's being nuanced in ways that I don't understand. Like, why do why did we think that other gods would provide us the things that actually? Anybody want to try and speak some of this out? Like, what else is going on here? Jen, can I invite you to to reflect on? Yeah, this one? I I want to move away from the sort of metaphorical system that was available to them at a the time and the like icky family metaphor <laughs> um, that I don't like, um, and kind of apply my own metaphor that that I suspect may be sort of relevant to what he was actually getting at. And that is like, it makes me think of how I feel about my country and how my country has put profit over people, has looked to benefit off the backs of slavery, off the backs of poverty, like all of those things and how easy it is for so many of us, especially on the sort of progressive side of things right now to go, that's what they did. That's what like the bad people in my country did. They better shape up and stop being so crazy so that the country doesn't suffer. Um, as opposed to, we have to look at how we have been part of that, how we have been facilitating that and, and profiting from it and benefiting from it as that mother's children. Um, and we have to do something to stop it because the true place that all of that sustenance should be coming from is justice, mm -hmm. is wholeness, uh, and not where it has been coming from. So that, that's how it's speaking to me. And I don't know the larger context to know if that's really what was being spoken to then. And ironically, this is coming in a census, the year after a census year for us. So maybe that's another reason why I'm thinking about it that way. That's great. That's great. No, I think that that's a very, that is a very helpful reading. The, and, and it builds on, I'm going to turn to Yonatan again, because I didn't hear what he said before, but it builds, I think, on on, on a direction that Yonatan was, was, was taking us earlier, which is uh, you know, the idea that Hosea is critiquing the ruling powers, his own society, but not able necessarily to say it explicitly. And so this is a kind of, there's a theology in here, but on some basic level, this is a way of saying this, this, country, this state, this, this society is in ruins. 
right? Yonatan, do you want to get, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm curious what, what you would say about this. Oh, sure. I mean, for starters, these materials the the prophet chooses are not coincidental, right? These are the materials at the temple, the materials of the vessels, and then he goes into the the grain and the wine, which the translator renders as new grain and new wine, because those were the sacrifices that were offered, and the wool and linen, which covers the nakedness, and the wool and the linen made the cover for the Holy of Holies in the Mishkan, right? For the that went above the uh, the Ark of the Covenant. So there's, I, I think maybe this text isn't quite as gruesome as we want to think it is. Maybe there's a recipe in here of how to like go back, right? It's like, well, you know, you guys know what you're supposed to do. It's all in there. Just go do it. Okay. Okay. I want, I, I, I want very much to hear from, from the other hands that are up, but on that note, and because we're, we were, we're at about 12 minutes, I want to, um, there is a recipe in here and there's a little, there is a kind of um, a remedy in here. And I want to get us there because I want to see, we can keep analyzing what's wrong, but I also, there's a kind of a, the, the Haftarah ends on a, a, a happier note. I'm still playing with this metaphor. I want us to see the turn that Hosea makes. So let's just make sure we see that before we close, because I think that, that this is important too. So what did we say? Uh, None shall save her from me. I'll end all her rejoicing. And here things do get kind of explicit, her festivals, her new moons, her Sabbaths, right? That's us, all of her festive seasons. I will lay waste her vines and her fig trees, which she thinks are a fee she received from her lovers. And I will turn them into brushwood and the beasts of the field shall devour them. Thus, I will punish her for the days of the Baalim on which she brought them offerings. When decked with earrings and jewels, she would go after her lovers, forgetting me, declares the eternal. Now. Some of you have seen this and noticed this before, but this will be really important. So I want to emphasize it now. Balim, here, and here in Hebrew, it's a word for the gods, but it is also a word that is used to mean husbands, right? It's a word that means master. And unfortunately, the ancient word for husband was master, you know, my master, my Baal. So that's a word for a foreign god, and it's also a word for other husbands. And then it's like the metaphor kind of collapses. It becomes actual, right? The gods themselves is, are referred to as, as husbands or husbands themselves are referred to as terrifying gods, right? All right, so that's, that's disturbing stuff, you know, still coming down, the, down the, the pike here. But now there's a twist, okay? And, and this, is, this is important just so we don't leave it on a disturbing note, but also this is part of what Hoshea is trying to do here in this, uh, in this in co condemnation, suddenly there's a turn. And he says, so I will lure her back. I will lure her back and lead her through the wilderness and speak to her heart. And there's that word again, midbar. L'chen hine anochi mifateha and I'll lead her through the wilderness and speak to her heart. And I will give her vineyards from there and the valley of Achor as a plow land of hope. And then she shall respond as in the days of her youth when she came up from the land of Egypt. And here, this is the most important line in the reading. And in that day, declares the eternal, you will call me Ishi, my man, and no longer will you call me Bali, which you could translate as my husband. But the word is quickly used in the other way, for I will remove the names of the Baalim from her mouth. Okay, so speaking of poetry, you see like this line especially, you see kind of what's going on here? From the very beginning, right? Um, the, the Hosea said, she's not my woman, my Ishti, and I'm not her man. And then eventually there's some sort of reconciliation, right? I'll lead her through the desert and speak to her heart. And then on that day, you'll call me Ishi and not Baali. Now, what do we make of that? First of all, what does that mean for the desert journey? What, is, what does Hoshea mean when, when, when he suggests that the father, the father of this metaphor will suddenly start speaking coaxingly to his to his wife and lure, speak to her heart with tenderness. And then whatever happens 
in that desert there, eventually they reach a place where you call me Ishi and not Bali, which is another way of saying you call me my man and not my master. Okay, so there's a, like there's a lot there. Okay, I, I'm now just opening the field for interpretation. Alexandra, I love this. Um, I to me it's um, to me it's like it's it's harsh. But it's also who was being spoken to required uh, like a harshness and a bit of fear for it to land. But it's also just sort of um, the spiritual principle that when you disconnect from God, God, you're not in alignment with the um, with all the abundance that can that could come and rain down on you if you were connected. But it's also so beautiful that even if we do disconnect, and even when we are lost in that wilderness, like that, that there is that that voice to our heart calling us back to to that place. And when we consciously make the decision to connect to God and to recognize that my income doesn't come from my boss, my income comes from God. Um, that and when we recognize that everything comes from God, then we're no longer like mastered by God, but we're in a partnership with God. And I think it's I think it's lovely. I love everything you just did there, Alexandra, because I think uh, Alexandra is we I am realizing there's so much more to do here. We only have a few minutes, left, but Alexandra actually did a nice job of, of synthesizing a lot of the language here, because a lot of the language is obsessed with like with stuff and with getting stuff and being rewarded by relationships with these other gods. And here they are in the desert. And Alexandra says that there, there is at least, a, like at least one way to read this at least is that we think that we can get our sustenance from other sources. We think that, oh, well, things are going hard right now, but if I pray to the God of rain, I'll get rain, right? Like, and we have these tradition, lots of gods out there. And part of the message of this harsh desert journey is no there's only one God. you only have one source and you have to keep relying and i know it's hard and you keep thinking oh we'll find another force or god or deity or the old the old gods the old master but you got to figure out how to just be in relationship with with this god and once you are in that relationship suggests alexandra it's not submitting yourself to the master it's just now being tapped into the the one true force of the universe Right? So that I, that's 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 very nice work. That's a very nice way of 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 incorporating a lot of the images that we've seen. Um, let's try to get a couple more comments before we close. Hal. So uh, I think it's very interesting that uh, you know the the whole meaning of the desert or the wilderness is being turned upside down from the earlier notion of barrenness that, you know, here the, the change takes place back in the desert. It's a return to first principles. The desert was where, that was the crucible for forming the identity of the, of the, the Hebrew people, the Israel, Israelite people. And so, so here it's going back to first principles and jettisoning, you know, Baal and, and the, the, you know, these images of uh, selling out and materialism and all of that. I mean, so, you know, anthropologists have this concept of, uh, of revitalization. When a, when a culture or society is in crisis, there are these revitalization movements that come about that essentially return to first principles and strengthen them and get people on, on you know, a, a different path. And so I think that that's what going back to the desert uh, means here. So I love that. Very powerful language Hal, Hal offers us. The desert now is, let's go back to the desert. Let's just like get rid of all of the trees, all of the land. Let's just go back into the place where after all, Abraham had his first vision, where after all we gathered around Masa, where, where revelation takes place. And, and this, the desert can be a metaphor for harshness and punishment, but, but the, the metaphor of the desert switches in Hosea, right? And it becomes a place where I call her back. I, I lead her through the wilderness and in doing so speak to her heart. That is a kind of like return to first principles. Let's go back to the, 
to the ground zero for this religion. Let's get back, let's just clear everything, just be alone in the wilderness together and we will reconstitute our relationship. That's a good read. Okay, I think we have time for one more comment. Hannah Jensen. I'm just wondering about it instead as a place of transformation that sometimes when we're going through a lot of growth and transition and transformation, it looks like we've lost ourselves somehow because we're not where we expected to be or what people expected us to be, or we've broken out of some kind of box or we're trying to find ourselves, but that maybe that's how you find yourself is that it looks like you're lost for a while, but that the expansiveness of the wilderness and of the desert is actually exactly what gives people in this story the space and the people of Israel the space to find themselves and that it's not and that maybe part of what works about this the way that Hosea talks about it is that you start with this very extreme example of someone who seems so cast off and impossible to reconcile with and you realize that through enough time and exploration of this wilderness even that person can become partners with God that really it's a space of growth and transformation and not a space of casting someone off, but that this shows us what that arc looks like if we just give someone the kind of expansiveness to explore it. Beautiful. Okay, that's a perfect place to end on because indeed there is a, tr there is a transformation that happens here. We just, we just saw Hosea name it and, and Hannah gives it a, a much bigger, and I think importantly, a much bigger, um, uh, frame like a way of thinking of what does it mean for all of for for us to go through a spiritual process that is the desert and to transform and to to leave slavery and to become ready for statehood for the promised land right in the language of Hosea though remember that are you still there <laughs> in the language that I got another glitch in the language of Hosea though remember that the, the transformation is from being called um, my husband, Bali, to calling our God Ishi, my man. And now the, I want to end with this. Take a look at what Rashi says on this, on this passage. Now, we already pointed to the way this was playing around with different words for husband, one which is, is related to master and also related to, to gods. So what is Ishi? And take a look at what Rashi says here. This is worth the entire class. You shall call me Ishi. In other words, you shall worship me out of love and not out of fear. Ishi is an expression of, of marriage and the love of ones, it should say youth there, whereas Bali is an expression of mastership and fear, right? That's the transformation. Somehow in the midst of this, even though the metaphor starts with, I'm, uh, you've cheated on me and I'm going to get you and I'm, how dare you and I'm going to take away everything, I'm going to leave you but this is rage. This is jealousy. But eventually what God wants to say is, can we get back to a place where we have real intimacy? And in that place, you're going to see something different, which is that I never was your master. I'm your lover. I'm your man. I'm, I, I want to be in some kind of equal partnership with you, right? Some kind of at least like equal relational uh, partnership. And that's, that's important because not only, does it, not only does it do incredible things for our theology, it's also embedded in that is a kind of a critique of, of the very gender dynamics that have been agitating us all along, right? Like somewhere in there, Hosea is also saying that a husband shouldn't be a master, right? And that's important too. So when we end the reading of Hosea, these are some famous last lines in the reading, it ends, um, and after all that, um, um, I will betroth you to me forever, a new marriage. And I will betroth you to me with righteousness and justice, as, as Jen said, and with goodness and mercy. And I will betroth you to me with faith. And then you shall know the eternal. Then you shall know the eternal. As if you never did, you never really understood what God was about because you thought God was just another master. And that's not what this relationship is about. This relationship is supposed to be about love. And I think both parties are still struggling to, to work that out. Um, hope that our, our learning today uh, brings some spirit of, of peace into the world and certainly um, peace in the, in, the, in the land of Israel. Uh, wishing you all a good week and, uh, and a powerful revelation.
uh, if you join us or or wherever you 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 seek your your revelation this Shavuot. Have a good one.